Welcome to the Last Drop Business Podcast, where we have the privilege of interviewing successful business owners who have maintained their sobriety. These entrepreneurs have achieved great success while staying sober, inspiring all of us to overcome challenges and to achieve our goals. So whether you're someone who is in recovery, an entrepreneur, or just someone looking for stories of hope, The Last Drop is your source of inspiration, motivation, and empowerment in the business place. I'm your host, Tim O, and please join us as we celebrate The Last Drop, the moment where everything changes and the real journey begins. All right, welcome to The Last Drop Business Podcast, where we celebrate the incredible journeys of individuals who have embraced a sober lifestyle and found strength, resilience, and purpose in the process. I'm your host, Tim O'Connor, and in today's episode, episode number two, uh, we have Sean Murphy, an amazing photographer who has shot bands like Weezer, Green Day, Kid Rock, uh, and has amazing and timeless outdoor and lifestyle photography. What's up, Sean? Glad to have you on here. What's happening, my man? Thanks for having me. Of course. How's your week been? Did you you just get back from like South Africa, Africa? South South Africa. Yeah, we were there for 10 days. It was fucking crazy. I mean, what were you doing? It's it feels like you're in California. If Arizona were in California, it feels kind of like that. And you're like, oh, it doesn't feel much different from the United States. And all of a sudden you're surrounded by baboons or there's like a zebra or an ostrich on the beach or something. It was it was a trip. It was really cool. We're there for boat boards, and we are shooting uh, five or six video pieces on different people. The host of Survivor South Africa, who is this really cool guy called Nico, and we did this <clears throat> overlanding trip with with this company called Al- Al- Alucab, and they do like all the overlanding stuff. And they gave us five. <laughs> Five fucking just decked out the raddest trucks you've ever seen. And then a couple of dudes came with us and we we convoyed out to this place in the middle of the desert called the uh, Tonkwa Karoo. And it's like an oasis in the middle of the desert. And we hung out there for a couple of days and, you know, Sweet. it was just really cool. Yeah, I enjoyed it. But I'm glad to be back. That's badass. Yeah, it was super That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, glad you're back, man. Glad you're back. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, kind of starting from the beginning, like the who, what, how, uh, then advancing into kind of like the lowest of your lows. Um, after that, we'll kind of turn the corner and get back into, um, you know, how you picked yourself up. How did you get to where you're at now and uh, how you continue to like build your photography career up to, um, you know, this point being sober. So uh, are you ready for your last drop story? I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's do it, baby. All right. All right. So why did you get into photography? So uh so how it started was kind of weird. I was, I don't know, eighteen, late eighties, and I was very terrible in school and barely graduated. And a friend of mine and I moved to Hawaii to surf uh on the North Shore when I was eighteen and then you know, I came back from that and just kind of, you know, just kind of didn't have any direction, so to speak. And my mom uh, and my dad said, well, if you go to Orlando with your little brother, we'll pay for your apartment. You can go to community college, you can go to UCF, and they can kind of keep us together in a condo in Orlando. All that, all that really did is give me free reign. I mean, very quickly, I got to Orlando, got plugged into like immediately into the club scene, the ecstasy scene, was dealing ecstasy and cocaine and, you know, binge drinking and partying. It was the best time ever. And, (laughs) but at the same time, I did take a community, uh, a class at a community college called Valencia. And I did, I was there for a half a semester. I had this one, I took a photography course because there was nothing else to take. I mean, you know, I was just trying to kind of take an easy course, like an art course, because I was an artist. I, I painted a little bit. I dabbled. I did a little bit of painting, a little bit of, you know, designing clothes, um, some sculpture, yeah, a, a little music. I wasn't fucking really good at any of them. I was, <laughs> I was a, a, you know, a dabbler, a pretty creative person, but, but without focus. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. I, but I was very good at waiting tables and working in the, you know, the restaurant uh, in, industry, uh, the, you know, and I thought in my head, I was like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, working in uh, it's a hotel management or that mm. something in that in that field. I really enjoyed it. I was good at it. Um, but that being said, I took a photography course uh, and there was this dude named Bob Engington and he was the, the photo instructor in I reflect back on it now and I've done the math. And when I was in the class, I remember him as being a really old dude and he was kind of gimpy and had like this, his hands were a little bit tweaked out. His skin on his hands was yellow. He kind of had a limp and he was around the school. They're like, Oh, that guy's a big deal. Like he used to be uh, a photographer for life magazine and he had mm. a couple of Life magazine covers, and I thought that was pretty cool. Like he he was kind of like wow. a war a war photographer, and had done a bunch of that kind of iconic stuff. And but when I got in his class, immediately, you know, he he took us into the dark room, and as a group, and he it, he had a, a a strip of negatives, and he walked us through the process of like putting it in the the negative carrier and putting it in the enlarger and then showing us what the chemistry was. And I was in this, this red lighting and, and the smells of the chemistry. And I was just kind of like, what the fuck's going on? And he would expose the film and put it in the, in the tray and its image popped up. And I was like, Oh, fucking that was it for me. That was the moment where I was like, Oh my God, I can do some, I can come up with an image or uh, some kind of creative situation take the mm. picture, go develop the film and go and, and, and have the end result be pretty fast, pretty instantaneous. And I have very short attention span. So for me, yeah. you know, painting or sculpting, or waiting for shit to dry and fucking paint, you know, the, the never knowing when to stop a painting and the yeah. kill, the kill, there's a lot of shit to do. So for me, mm -hmm. this was like the answer to my, my ADD kind of moving fast artistic that was the the missing piece for me. So, hmm. I, I he he and I bonded very quickly, and he came to me within a couple of weeks, and he told me something. He said, uh, he said, do he said, Sean, man, you can you anything you can dream up, anything, anything in the world, no matter how crazy it is, you can put it on, you can take it with a camera, and create it in the dark room, hmm. uh, meaning. You know, I could make us build a set and do, and I started following people like uh, Joel Peter Whitkin, who's this kind of macabre photographer who would shoot cadavers and dress them up and do this kind of weird theatrical shit. Andy Leibovitz, really? who was shooting musicians and dressing them up and doing oh, these yeah. kind of character studies. And I, I was just really drawn to that. And I, I was like, man, this is so, so cool. And I was just, that was it. It just, and then, what 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 happened was he halfway through the semester he said you know Sean I think you have something special you should go you should leave here and go to New York or Boston and go to school and further your education because we don't really have that here to offer you and I I was like I just quit school and moved to Boston yeah. there's a longer story to that uh, very quickly. Yeah. Very quickly, I was at a club one night, and <laughs> kind of at the same time he said this, I was out one night partying at this club, and it was like four yeah. in the morning, downtown Orlando, and it's like just the stragglers were left dancing, and there was these two girls sure. dancing on the stage, and I came up to them. I thought I assumed they were high, and they're like, no, no, we don't do drugs. I'm like, what the fuck are you guys dancing? Like, it's four in the morning. <laughs> we're listening to Acid House and dancing. And it's like four in the yeah. morning and they had this weird accent and they're like, Oh, we're from, we're from, uh, they were from Boston from one was from Maine and one was from Massachusetts. And they're like, we're going to go there this week. We're going to go to, to, to Maine. And I was like, fuck, I never been to Maine. I go, I'll drive, you know, if you guys want, if I can, I just met them. They're like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so I like just drove them to fucking Maine. And on the way to Maine, we stopped through Boston to see a friend of theirs, and he went took took us to some nightclubs and stuff. And I'd mm. never really been to like a, a really cool 
city, city, like on the yeah. East Coast. And I was just really drawn to that city. And at this, that time, my teacher also said that same thing to me like a couple weeks before. So it all kind of clicked. I was like, I'm going to Boston. Like this is, this is, a, is meant to be. And oh, then yeah. I uh, kind of, I worked for a couple more months, saved some money, um, talked to one of my friends that I grew up with into moving with me. And she ended up being my wife later on <laughs> and having kids Damn, with me. Okay. But uh, <laughs> we moved to Boston and, and uh, you know, I found this little school. Called, well, not it's a little school called New England School of Photography, but it had been around for many, many, hmm. many decades and was really famous in, in Kenmore Square. And I got accepted to that school and worked at the Marriott and partied and went to school. And, you know, <laughs> the rest is history, I guess, is, you know. Um, yeah, that was that was kind ass. of my that was kind of my start. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So like during that time after you got into after you moved up to Boston, do you feel like um you know, did your like drinking partying increase more and do you feel like that helped with your creativity while you were advancing in your photography career? Yeah, so I I think you know, I I hear it's a similar story, I think, with a lot of us, right? It's like mm. when I was in Boston, I worked at the Marriott. I was a waiter. I went to school. I was I immediately, you know, it's it, that saying, you know, wherever you go, you, you can't, you're, you find yourself and you find your people. Mm -hmm. You're drawn to these certain people. I can go to any town and I can immediately find, you know, the drug dealers and the partiers and all this, this type of people that are like me. It's very easy, you know? Yeah. Um, I can't go mm -hmm. to any bar and tell who's doing cocaine by just the look on their face and who's going to the bathrooms. And so I go to Boston and I immediately, you know, that's that's my scene. I, I go to the, I go, I went, hung out the gay clubs because I really enjoyed the, the gay lifestyle. I like the, mm. the straight dude in the gay world and all the yeah. makeup art, the makeup artists, and the, this, all the creatives tended to be there, and and so, but also the drug, the drugs, and that lifestyle were part of that. And I would say at that time, in the beginning days, you know, it was more of a binge situation. Yeah. So, so I worked every day at like five a.m. Was never late to work worked till I think two, three, and then I went to school. And then I had a full to full time school uh load and with lots of assignments. And somehow be was Val Victorian and employee of the year the same year. So that I mean mm -hmm. that says something. And yeah. I was doing Coke all the time and drinking and uh yeah. bal balancing it all. I mean I just you, you know you, I could just do it at, in when I was twenty one, twenty two. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. I and I attribute at that time, you know, I attribute a lot of my creativity and the drive was there, even without the drugs and alcohol. But I feel like it just kind of fueled that that fire and put me into scenarios that created, you know, the opportunity for special things to happen. So. Yeah. I'm hanging out with creative people. I'm at clubs. I'm up all night. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm working at the Marriott. I'm at school. So I'm constantly just all over the, the show. Uh, I had a really creative girlfriend who was a big part of my life and was um, still is. I mean, we're not married anymore, but she's still very close to me. And she mm. was my, my muse. And I had this beautiful woman to photograph and that would do would you know, do anything I needed her to do for my, for my art. And it was really cool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so that's kind of how it was in the beginning, you know, for a long time, really, like, you know, we were in Boston for a couple of years till I graduated. She was a dental assistant and she supported me while I was trying to get my career off the ground. But it took a while, you know, we moved uh, back to Hawaii after Boston uh, for a break from the snow mm -hmm. and to surf for a while. And, you know, I was there for about a year and I I didn't surf that much. I was just doing coke the whole time yeah. in, the in the clubs in paradise. I was in paradise 
in the sun, hiding from the sun because I was up all the time and, and partying. Mm. But, you know, I, I did do some photography and got a couple of assignments. But what happened then was this, there's always always in life, there's all these, these cool, I don't know. I feel really lucky because, I, like I said, you're drawn to certain people. Just cool things just kept coming my way, you know. Yeah, yeah. And if you're if you're putting yourself out there, you, you know, half the battle or ninety percent of the battle is just fucking showing up. Yeah, exactly. And and that's in with with everything. And and so when we were in Honolulu, this was would be nineteen ninety three. Mm-hmm. And the, that show, The Real World, you know, on MTV. Oh yeah, yeah. That that was happening. That was a big deal. And they were doing, uh, they were casting for Real World San Francisco. And so, oh, wow. I, so I applied for that. And then we were, we were in Hawaii, and we get this letter. And, you know, back then there's no cell phones or internet and shit. It's just like you're getting fucking letters. Yeah, yeah. So we, we got a letter. It's like they wanted they i had made it to the second phase and they wanted more pictures and they wanted oh, man. Uh, this whole this some 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 they had a bunch of questions and questionnaires and things and so i did that and we sent it off and we're like oh this nothing's ever going to come of this well a couple i don't remember the timeline but let's say a couple months go by and my girlfriend i was at work at this restaurant and she called the job and she's like oh my god they you just got a letter they want you to like you've made it to like this other level. Right. And they wanted oh me to go, go to San Francisco. So anyway, I go to San Francisco and I'm too old though. I can't, this is how I remember it. It was a long time ago, but I was going to be 24 in December. And I think that was a cutoff time or something happened. And mm. so I didn't get on, but that there, the guy who got my spot was Puck, this guy, Puck. I don't know okay. if you ever saw that episode. It was this other, this annoying guy that kind of looked like me. We, I guess they're oh looking my. for this certain, but I didn't get on the show, but I ended up staying in San Francisco. She okay. ended up coming with me, nice. moving to San Francisco. And we had this rad life. We worked at the Phoenix hotel, which is in the tenderloin. I talk about this a lot. Uh, you know, the Phoenix hotel in it's still there. It's where uh-huh. all the band, every band that comes to San Francisco, they all stay there. It's this little uh-huh. motel. And they all stay there and there's a restaurant connected and there's a pool in the middle. And it's, it's, it's a ghetto all around it. But when you're in this oasis, it's this really cool hip spot and all the tour buses were always there. And it's just like this, it's kind of like that movie, almost famous, right? Where everyone's partying. It's, it's, it's much like that. Okay. (laughs) But so I got to meet, I have endless stories of all these, you know, bands coming and meeting me and I get used to get them drugs and, then we'd become friends for the short amount of time they were in town. We'd party and we'd go to the shows and take their pictures. And But at that same time, there was this gay couple named Richard and Riley, and they started a magazine called Surface Magazine, which is still around mm. today. Now it's like this really big magazine, like a kind of like a, a, a Vogue type okay. high and fashion magazine. But back then, in the early 90s, it was like a paper like just a rag kind of really lo-fi but they somehow got all these really famous bands to agree to be part of their their magazine and they met me at a club and they would give me every fucking like hey man you want to shoot you know peter murphy and nina hagen and tears for fears and i mean the list goes on (laughs) tricky so sometimes they would have me shoot uh a band and then that band, I'd end up waiting on them that night. Like, I, I would shoot them, <laughs> and, and they'd look up, and I'd be like, hey, can I get you a fucking drink from the bar? Like, thought I, you know, I was like, what, what a trip, you know? But, you know, that that whole that whole time period was so amazing, and, and, and it really just kind of got things rolling for me. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's the drugs were crazy. That's when I started doing crystal meth. That's mm. when that that got introduced to my life, um, and I remember working at the the restaurant at the Phoenix Hotel, and I had this little Vespa, you know, and we had our drug dealer named Nacho, and he lived in the Mission, and we'd it'd be a busy full station, be on a Friday night, and we'd always draw straws to see who's going to get the coke, and like I would yeah. I would give someone my 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 
station. They would watch my tables while I would drive the Vespa, get the Coke, and then we'd oh all be God. high or someone would bring a bag of meth and we'd, all, you know, we, so we were always just all fucked up the whole time and pounding yeah, margaritas. Yeah. It was, a, I mean, that was like that every single day for mm. the whole time, three years I was there. And, and but somehow yeah. still managing to keep work, you know, that mm. getting my career off the ground, right? And then uh, that magazine gave me an assignment to go to Los Angeles to shoot Tears for Fears mm-hmm. at the Chateau Marmont. And one of the girls that worked there with me, uh, we rented a Mustang convertible. And mm-hmm. we drove down PCH all the way to California. We had never been to Los Angeles. And we got there and it was like fucking palm trees. It was hot outside. Yeah. We'd pull up to the Marmont. And I was like, God damn, this is the place for me, man. This is like, this, mm. that shit was so changed my life. Like it just felt, felt right. And yeah. so, you know, moving forward, uh, you know, that took me to Los Angeles and that's where I spent the last, I just moved back to Florida. I'm currently in Florida, Fort Walton beach, Florida, but I've been here for four years Prior to here, I was in Los Angeles for twenty three years. Damn. So that's where all that's where all the that's where all the shit <laughs> went down, you know. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that so that's kind of that's kind of the beginning phase. But yeah. you know, when when I got to Los Angeles, you know, this story is so there's so many layers to it, and I could go on all day. But as I'm trying, I'll try yeah, to yeah. paraphrase, but. You know, we lived in a, a loft downtown, but there was a point in time uh, where I was, you know, I realized, you know, you have these moments, at least for me, where it was just kind of fun for a long time. Mm-hmm. And But then there was this one day where I was like, uh, I'm fucking drink. Well, I'm kind of drinking every day, like in the day, like noon. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like it just, mm-hmm. it just was... Uh, it was unusual for me because I was more of a bin a binge drinker, or yeah. I'd go like drink I drink for two or three or four days and do crystal meth on the weekends and then mm-hmm. maybe be fucked up on Monday, but then Tuesday through Friday I'd be really productive. Decent, um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like I I just listened. Do you ever listen to the Red Hot Chili Peppers book that Anthony Kiedis? He, I haven't he talk, heard it yet. the amount of work that they produced in their careers so insane and he was yeah. so fucked up the whole time he talks about like having these little windows where he got so much work done and i kind of feel like a little bit like that it's like mm. i did waste mm-hmm. a lot of time fucking wasted partying but even when i was high on meth and out running around los angeles for three or four days it was, yeah. I was making, I was making connections. You know, I was making work connections. For sure, Meet, meeting people, shooting people. It's like that's kind of the lifestyle, right? You're, you know, you're yeah. running around Hollywood and hanging out with musicians, and and then mm-hmm. I'd be up, maybe up for this album cover or something. And coincidentally, I've been partying with the band, and they knew me, <laughs> so I'd get the job. You know, so it kind of worked in my favor for many, many years. Wow. Um, but wild, you know couple of quick notes i you know like at 28 had a heart attack and from doing coke and uh you know i was hanging out with one of my best friends still to this day is uh frank zappa's kid amit and we're working together to now on on stuff but way back then we were just hanging out he lived down the street and we became friends from a photo shoot and and i remember and he didn't do drugs and he didn't drink and i had this whole group of friends that they were kind of teetotalers, right? They they were just they were mm. cool. But they didn't drink, they mm-hmm. didn't do drugs. Is this weird? But they hung out with me. I remember going yeah. to his house. I go to his house and my shitty little Volkswagen. Be like, uh, I think I'm having a heart attack. And he's like, I'm not fucking taking you to the doctor. Like, I'm not. I hate the doctors. I'm not going to take you. And I'm like, somebody needs to take me to the fucking doctor. I'm about to die. And another one of the guys that's sitting at the house takes me and whatever. It's a whole this whole experience. And I'm they get to the doctor at 28 years old, and the doc and the, and the this female doctor comes in after they kind of bring me down, and yeah. she she goes she goes I hate to say this she goes cocaine that's the worst that's the worst thing you can do he goes you could just have a your heart's having a bad day and you're just gonna die and it wears out the I mm. hear the I, I heard what I wanted to hear 
She's like, it wears yeah, down yeah. the lining. It, here, it wears down the lining of your heart. And, you know, I see people, you know, they could do it forever. And then one day you just drop. But, you know, even crystal meth is better than Coke. It doesn't. And so I heard, I heard, oh, fucking crystal meth is okay. Like, let's do that. <laughs> you know, so that became, you know, that that was all I needed to hear is like crystal meth. Like, that's going to be my thing now. It's safe. Like, mm. I don't want to, you know, and then I, and then, and I, I kind of jump all over the place. And, and my, my, you know, I listen to people speak sometimes and I'm always amazed at how articulate their story is. And mm. I feel like mine's very complicated. Of course, it's me and I'm, I'm thinking I'm fucking special somehow. And my story is <laughs> different. But we're, it's all the same story, but yeah, the, the in-between of like ha- the beginning to now and all the mm-hmm. the shit in between was for me was very complicated. And yeah. at, at 28 years old after that, that heart attack happened, uh, that same guy, Amit, said to me, you know, at, at least for me, my mo- my mom – my wife, my girlfriend, my brother, they can all tell me, you know, how fucked up I am and, and how I, it's a problem, but I don't really mm-hmm. hear it, right? But when a good yeah. friend tells me this shit, it somehow, yeah. I hear it. So he uh-huh. told me, he's like, man, he goes, I fucking love you, dude, but when you drink, I fucking hate you. And Oof. I don't want to, I don't want to be around you. So somehow that hit hard and, 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 and I didn't know much about AA at the time. Yeah, I did hear some people talk about being sober. Some musicians, they'd be at my house doing a shoot or something, and they'd, I'd hear them talking about it. So I, I kind of heard about it. My grandfather had tw- a bunch of years sober, like 20-something years. Um, but I didn't know much about AA. But I do remember the first time I went to a meeting after Amit had told me that I, I picked up a six-pack of Heineken. <laughs> I looked in the yellow pages. Yeah, for Alcoholics Anonymous, uh-huh. and then I called Central <laughs> Office, and they mm. told me they told me where there was a meeting in Larchmont Village, and I chugged the fucking six pack because in my mind I was like, oh, this is the last six pack. I'm <laughs> done. I'm done I'm going to A. I'm done after this. It's over. So I drank yeah. the whole six pack, and then a buddy of mine took me to the meeting. He I met him, and he took me to the meeting. The meeting was a blur. I I just drank a six pack of beer and went to a meeting, my first meeting, right? And and sounds familiar. I don't remember what they said, but I was scared, and it was a lot of Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, you know jingles and and prayers and shit, and I was just like, "What the fuck?" And I, I I I think I left and didn't go back for a minute. I think I mm-hmm. left and then relapsed probably right away. I didn't relapse. I didn't have anything to relapse from. I just, <laughs> I, I went to a meeting and then I drank again. And, For sure. And then <clears throat> I had a, a couple of little car things happen where I had, a, I, I hit, I did a hit and run and that scared me. And I, then yeah. I was like, I, I just got, and then another friend is like, started taking me to this gay meeting in uh, West Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And I actually got some, a little bit of time there and um like i don't know 30 days maybe yeah right but it was but but i but but i uh, it was for me it was a constant i was i was a a, her habitual relapser i just couldn't get i couldn't fucking get it i wasn't hearing Mm -hmm. things you know i wasn't Mm -hmm. I, I, i was just going and raising my hand and i had a big book i i had a sponsor kinda but I wasn't doing any step work, you know, it, For sure. it, uh, kind of a little bit. I mean, he was like, eh, I didn't understand it. I wasn't, wasn't putting any work into it. I was just showing up and raising my hand. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, so yeah. I, I did that shit for a long time, you know? Uh, and, and then this really big thing happened. Uh, I managed to get uh, like six months and then I got a job. This is one of the other pinnacle things that happened. I got a job shooting Slayer. Um, mm-hmm. And 
we were so i was supposed to meet slayer at the record label in santa monica i drove my shitty volkswagen to <laughs> santa monica i was sober i'd like six months yeah the manager comes out of the record label and goes dude sit in the limo the band's gonna be out they have to do an, a phone interview whatever then we we're to drive to see the kings play a, a hockey game and i was okay. to, to take pictures of that, of that so i sat in this limo and there was this lit up little table that had vodka and different things like all just glowing and shit and i was there for like 30 minutes just sitting there and just like sweating like what the fuck am I, oh what is my it? god and then Torture. i just and then i just grabbed the vodka and chugged the bottle you know mm, and then damn. went into a blackout yeah. shot the shot the band at, at the king's game oh my god. uh went back to the label and then got in my car and tried to drive home in a black complete blackout Got pulled oh, over dude. in front of the meeting that I had been going to in West Hollywood in a blackout, no no shoes, no shirt, fucking Damn, didn't bro. you know do it that whole cops thing, you know, oh, yeah. and running people running onto the sidewalk, the whole thing, refusing to do the breathalyzer. They had to strap me down, take me to take me to the hospital, hospital. draw my blood, then take me to jail. Yeah. Uh, where I was belligerent and was there for like three days, and then I lost my license for for a year. You know uh, that that yep. cop. I remember that cop too. He was like, "Dude, I'm trying to help you. Like, if mm -hmm. you don't blow, you're gonna lose your license for a year, no matter what." And then in my head, I'm like, "My brother said, my brother who has three DUIs was like, never blow, never blow. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll, it, it. so don't anyway. get you." I lost Dude, my license for a year and um, and rode my bike around the valley with my camera and my portfolio and was just, a, you know, do, going to a lot of meetings, uh, okay. you know, so that's that's kind of how that period of time happened. But what did come of it is that a year later, right when I was getting my license back, my agent called and said, you're never going to believe this. But there's uh, an ad, someone, an art director at an ad agency in Austin, Texas, is getting her hair done. This is around Super Bowl time. She looked, okay. she saw the magazine of the Slayer shoot, and yeah. there was a blurry photo of me wasted, jumping. I, I, I had just the Kings had scored or something, and it, the audience went like this, and I just yeah. went a click, and so th there was a shot of the band going up. Like the wave, it, was kinda, yeah. it was kind. It was kind of like a panning shot. So they were in focus, but everything else was blurred. And, oh, the, and this girl, okay. this girl saw this, and she contacted my agent and want, wanted. To, I got a job shooting for Visa. It was my first advertising campaign for Visa for the Super Bowl, like making a, a, good, a good amount of money. So yeah, the silver lining from that whole experience was, you know, I. Uh, you know, I got a, my first big job came from that DUI and that experience. Damn, dude. And that, and, and that's happened many times in, in my life. But, um, you know, uh, fast forward. I mean, I don't know if you want to pause or anything. I can kind of run you through that, how bad it kind of was, the, what what happened. Yeah. And so what, and not long after that, my kids were born, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of years later, my kids were born. I, I have three sons. Um, you know, I was my wife at the time, you know, it was a constant disappoint. I was just disappointing. You know, it's like she was going to yeah. school to be a dental hygienist. She was working her ass off. And, you know, I was out at night or running down the street doing coke with my neighbors. And she was constantly trying to just get sleep and go to school and do her <laughs> thing. But she's having to babysit me. And, I'm oh my trying, God. trying yeah. to be, trying to be sober and doing the whole, you know, just a liar, a thief, and a cheat, and yeah. that's what, I, that's how I lived, and I was not to be trusted. Um, mm -hmm. I was botching jobs, and but somehow I, I kind of always had the personality to kind of come out of it, I guess. But yeah. I was always, always riding the line of just, you know, just being a fuck up. But creating yeah. somehow getting through the job. I had assistants that would travel with me and babysit me. It was just a fucking mess, man. It was terrible. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, 
my wife and I split up when my kids are about five. Mm. I just, you know, I ru I ruined that, you know, I ruined my marriage. I, mm. you know, started just, I was scandalous and I was doing drugs all the time and, yeah. uh, and I just ruined it. I, I, ru I left, I ruined that marriage. And, um, and when I left my wife, that's when shit got really, 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 really bad. And I just, I just started doing meth all the time. Mm. Uh, got, you know, my, even my work, my photography, like I, I can't really look at that, that period. Like if I'm going through hard drives, anything yeah. from like 2007 to 2000, I don't know, 10. It's yeah. just very, it's very hard for me to look at, you know what I mean? Um, for sure. Just a dark, dark, dark time. And I started seeing another woman that later became my second wife <laughs> yeah. and and she you know she didn't know i was doing drugs and i was hiding it from her somehow she you know somehow she didn't know and wow. uh you know i was driving around with my kids in the car after being up for days at a time and taking them to school and you know thinking yeah. people don't know but you know everybody knows what the yeah. fuck's going on you know for sure and, there was a point where I just, you know, I don't know how it was for you, but for me, I kind of mm. sensed the jig was up. I sensed that it, there was going to be an intervention or something, you know, like it was getting yeah. to the point where like my, it was just, I sensed it. And I just decided I went on the computer and I was like, looked up rehabs and I found one in my mm. hometown here where I live now. And I put myself, I just called them and I flew there. I didn't tell anybody really and, until I was at the airport. And then I texted people. I'm like, I'm going to rehab. And Damn. I went to rehab and managed to get eight months clean after that. Oh, then yeah. relapsed and went to another rehab in Los Angeles. Mm. And leaving the second rehab, I remember how cunning, baffling, and powerful the disease is like I can go to rehab yeah. and, and feel like I'm okay, but there's this something, this little itch back here, something is telling me, yeah. Uh, like I, I'm not quite done. Like there's a, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's, is a, there's a possibility that I'm going to use again. And the met, the meth is what brought me to my knees, you know, um, Mm -hmm. I always am an alcohol. I was an alcoholic from the start. I used, oh, yeah. and, I, and as one of my sponsors later <clears throat> would describe it, you know, I used drugs because there was this, I was like, am I an alcoholic or am I a drug addict? What am I? I'm an addict. I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm an everything. He's like, well, you use drugs, alcoholic, but you're, you know, you're, it's all Ooh. the same kind of shit. Yeah, that's good. I mean? Yeah, so, totally. So I remember leaving that <laughs> rehab, that rehab and driving to my drug dealer's house from rehab, like straight there, <laughs> like that day, yeah. that, that moment and picking mm -hmm. up a baggie. And, and then I immediately checked myself into a sober living house, but I always <laughs> would pick the, the nicest ones, right? Like I didn't want it to be, <laughs> of course. I didn't, I didn't want to be suffering too much. So I, yeah. and I, and I had a girlfriend that lived with me, so I didn't want, I didn't want to lose her. So I, mm -hmm. I, I knew like, oh, if I just go to sober living, I can, I can appease her and I can kind mm -hmm. of keep things going. And so I went to the sober living house and we used to have a meeting at this, this house on one of the nights. And, and we, so we were having a meeting at the house and there was this Irish guy next to me and he seemed to have a lot of time. Like he talked really good about mm. the program and about the book and sponsorship. And he was about my age and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and after the meeting, his name is Irish Mike. And after the meeting, he's like, Hey, Murphy, have you done the steps? And I'm like, no. And he goes, have you read the doctor's opinion? I was like, what's that? You know, he's like, come on, we're going to read the doctor's opinion right now. And I was like, Damn. Oh, okay, fuck. So we go out back and he reads me the doctor's opinion. And I had done some, 
some step work with a previous sponsor and gotten, uh, I think, past step four. And I thought I was mm. doing a, a pretty good job at it, but apparently yeah. I was missing a lot of shit. Um, mm. I, I mean, missing the doctor's opinion and didn't really hear it until whatever, for whatever reason, this time with this guy at this evening, like click, he, it, he, he read it to me and the way that he is, maybe it was his accent, his Irish accent or his excitement or the fact that he would pause and, and kind of italicize certain segments or, relate it to his own life however he laid it out mm. for me it mm-hmm. was really powerful and i remember him there's one him reading to me uh that uh, i'm paraphrasing uh, you know but he was reading about <clears throat> if you do this 100 percent, it works 100 percent of the time you 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 will, you will recover right mm. and i always mm-hmm. thought you're always in recovery right uh, yeah, but it says you will recover if you do the steps thoroughly, one hundred percent of the time. And I was like, "Oh shit, mm. that's that's a fucking bold ass statement." And he's like, "Dude, yeah. like." And then he said to me, he had me hooked me, and he said, <laughs> "So you?" He goes, "I'm starting at Sober Living House in Chatsworth. Nobody's in it yet. I've rented this house. This guy was fucking crazy." He was a construction yeah. worker. He 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 had fucking bamboozled this big house in Chatsworth, and it was there was a horse living in the backyard, and he had a pit a pit bull. It was a shithole, and he okay. had, he he used to pick homeless dudes up off the street and bring them and just put them in this fucking house. Oh and my he, god, but, dude. but in this time he's like, so you Wild. come. He goes, you come to my house, and he goes, you you do the steps with me. 30 days, Murphy, you're fucking done. You go back to your, you, you, it'll work or it won't work. If it doesn't work, you can go back to doing meth, whatever you're doing. But if yeah. it does work, he goes, you'll be home in 30 days and back to your, you know, your life will be great, whatever. So I'm yeah, like, yeah, fuck, yeah. fuck it, I'll try. That's some, that's, in my mind, I was like, well, if I do that, yeah, then everyone will get off my fucking back. And yeah. and then if it doesn't work, I can say I tried my best, and then Damn. it didn't work, and and I'll just be a meth. And I in my mind at that time, as insane as it sounds, I thought to myself, maybe I'll just be that will be my life. Like I maybe I'll just be a meth addict, a yeah, functioning right? a, a functioning meth addict. Like that's it's not optimal, but I can. I mean, that's maybe how I can it, do it. It. that's that that might yeah. be the car, cards for me. So uh-huh. I, I, w- I lived in that house. That was the best. I was there for five months. I lived in a, gr- in, a gr- in the garage on a cot with, okay. him, with my sponsor and like three other fucking gangbanger, like dudes that mm. just got out of prison. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the house was filled, man, with like people, just swastikas, Mexicans, Jesus. black dudes. Yeah. It didn't matter. It was this whole like we're all together, and all trying to all, get one thing. We're all the same, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was very rough in that house. Like you, it was real. Like if yeah. you ever hung out with a with a house full of, like fifteen dudes that just got out of prison, like just got out of prison, and, oh man, and um. And some a couple homeless dudes and this guy and that guy and you know, it's a unique environment. But yeah, this house was extremely special. And they started doing this Friday night meeting. Mm. Uh, that that the house was called Plan C, and we did a meeting on Friday nights, which was like the big event of the week because it was like all the we all got to kind of look nice and girls would come cool. over and like all these other houses would come over. <laughs> And that, and it was a we got chips for doing steps. <laughs> Excuse me. So oh, cool. Instead of so so they would give out chips for people going through like different steps. And so if I had done my four step, I get a chip, and I'd say, you know, what does that look like for me? And you'd do a little speech, and it was really yeah. inspiring. And 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 the way that house was, the 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 concept was. 
uh, the, the thing that my sponsor told me a lot was, he's like, Murphy, they're dropping like flies out there. You've got to fucking get this shit. You've got to, mm-hmm. you've got to get through these steps and you've got to start sponsoring dudes. So, you know what I mean? And, and, mm-hmm. and, and I would, I was in the house after two months, I might've had five sponsors after two Damn. months. Like I was through the steps and I, and he was like, and was, we'd go to these meetings all over the Valley and we, it was like, we'd pull up in, the, in a truck full, loaded full of dudes and we'd go into a meeting and anyone to raise their hand as a newcomer, all of us would fight after fight over who was going to try to be their sponsor. So oh it was also, God. it was also, it was also taught to me, you know, don't fucking wait around for a get through the yeah. steps. Right. So you yes. can fix what's in here and relieve yourself of this, uh, addiction because, you know, I wasn't yeah. doing, I wasn't doing meth and drinking because I love to be fucking high yeah. uh, and love to be wasted all the time and never sleeping. Mm-hmm. I did it because I was fucked up in my insides. Right. So yeah. once yeah. I fit, once I fixed me, then the obsession was lifted and I could get on with my life. And, yeah. and that, and that has been the case for me. May 9th, 2011 was okay. as, as one was my last drink or drug. And I, you know, and I, I really, I love, you know, it's weird because I see a lot of people doing it a lot of different ways, but, yeah. It was very aggressive the way that the the house I was in and, and the environment that I was in was very hard, very harsh. Yeah. It was like mm-hmm. watching uh watching one of those reality shows about like fucking prison or scared yeah. straight or something. It was crazy. It was a really gnarly atmosphere, but at the same time, everyone was really, uh, you know, we were like a family this rotating mm-hmm. family. And yeah. um, I was the first one in the house that went through the steps. So I have my picture mm-hmm. on the wall in a frame. And I think <laughs> it's still there. Like people still talk about it. Like who the fuck is this guy? I was the Dude. first one that got through the steps. But, you know, it was like, and, and sometimes when I tell that, that, that concept of, you know, in a, in a, in like a meeting setting, yeah, I think I, sometimes I get side eyed and shit. Like I'll be like, <laughs> "Yeah, man," like I'll kind of make my son should be like, "Dude, just get fucking get some sponsees. You're gonna kill a few." Is what he'd always say. Like not literally, but yeah. maybe literally. Yeah. But li- but but I I don't really have a lot to offer at this point, except I know more than they do, or I have I have a, two more months than they do. I've been yeah, through yeah, the yeah. steps, and I'm practicing. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm practicing my pitch my sure. step work skills even now yeah. after after 12 years i will take someone through the steps and i need to go and i and i need to get some advice and some direction from my sponsor now to yeah. like dude i'm about to take this guy through this four step or whatever and can you help me refresh yeah. my memory um you know cuz my you know the success rate of people that get sober uh are trying to get sober isn't great you know what i mean like even mm-hmm. i can have the best pitch and i could be yeah. the most inspiring guy and to maybe this this person and you, there's nothing i can do if you're not ready and you're not willing mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. and, the, and you know look at me it took 11 years of fucking torture to get yeah, one one year, right? For sure. Um, yeah. r- ruining many people's, or, or I, I'm not gonna say I ruined people's lives. I was definitely a part. I had a part in the the ruining of some lives. Like yeah. I, had a, you know, people could leave me at any time, and and they don't need to be subjected to it. There's a lot of unhealthiness going on in relationships and stuff when there's using and drinking going on and unfortunately yeah. like you know when you're in a relationship what happens uh, often is you know there becomes this you know uh codependency and yeah. and that that person becomes sick because of us because of me yes yeah. and then they they exactly. don't know that they're even in it and they're just fucking mm-hmm. trying to fix me and 
So, you know, after 12 years, uh, you know, it, it, it's just a constant, it's constant, but I, but just now I'm now I'm in a relationship for the last, the last two years I've been in a relationship mm -hmm. and it's healthy. This woman has never seen me high or drunk. She doesn't even know what mm. that would look like for her because I'm not that person. I'm a different human than I was even yeah. five years ago. And even if, even five, six, seven years into my sobriety, you know, in retrospect, you know, I, I think about it sometimes. I'm like, man, there's a lot of periods of that, that time where I was, you know, not recovered because I was, mm. you know, um, I was married to a woman who I, 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 I don't think she's an alcoholic, but she drank a, a lot, you know, around around me kind of hung yeah. out with that 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 lifestyle and mm -hmm. i think looking back on it and it wasn't it wasn't the best fit for for me for her i just think you know what i mean it wasn't it wasn't great it wasn't amazing and now that yeah. i'm in something different i see how important it is to have boundaries and to you know put myself first like if I mm -hmm. if I'm not sober, then nothing else matters, right? I'm not no. a good. Yeah. I'm not gonna be a good dad, which is mm. my number one focus in, on Earth is being a good dad and being there for my kids, mm -hmm. and being a good employee, being honest, yeah. uh, always being honest, you know, and and yeah. truthful and all those things. And that that I think I'm to a point now where it's it happens subconsciously which is good but i'm not perfect and now and if mm -hmm. i slip up if i find myself talking shit about people or maybe i don't i do something that's slightly like a, a dishonest then i have mm -hmm. a solution right i can call another person in the program and run a tent step with them and and mm. see what my part is and i can keep and and keep my side of the street clean constantly. I have solutions yeah, to all yeah. my problems. So, you know, that's that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of it in a, a very a, a very short version, you totally. know. But but um, it was fucking terrible, you know. But yeah. but terrible and great at the same time. Would I be successful? If I had not done drugs, and I think of that all the time, I was like, "What? What would yeah. my life have looked like if I did do that?" I wouldn't even want to know because it it is my life is amazing, and I'm yeah. and I'm also very grateful that I am an alcoholic and a totally. drug addict because it yeah. makes me who I am today. I think you mm -hmm. know I'm more compassionate towards people, all types yep. of people. I I feel like I read people very pretty well. I feel like, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm the kind of man that I want to be yeah. because of what, where I was, unfortunately it, I, I hurt a lot of people along the way and that, that's mm -hmm. the, that's the fucking shitty part about it. But yeah. yeah, I, I can't live in the past. I can only, you know, you know, I've made, I'm making living amends, I guess, to a lot of people. And, um, yeah. I think, you know, people see, people love a comeback story, man. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. Like, look at Robert Downey Jr. and these, you know, these kind yeah. of people that just can do some crazy shit and come right back. And people love that, you know. So, yeah. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep, uh, doing, you know what I've been doing. It works for me. I do a meeting at my house at my studio every Thursday night Sweet. at seven thirty. Yeah. If there's any listeners, uh, we used to do Zoom, but we don't do it anymore because some of the people didn't care to be on camera in the meeting. So sure. yeah, we yeah. we don't do do that anymore. But if anyone's in Florida or in the Panhandle, come on by. It's uh, yeah. it's a good time. It's um, awesome, man. So mm -hmm. what, what would you, what advice would you have for any like creatives or business owners or entrepreneurs that are like struggling with addiction, alcoholism, if you were to say anything, or even just like someone who is out there listening to this right now, it's like, dude, how do I 
get my shit together. Because for me, I know it was like, that was the first part is I like didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know who to talk to it about it. I was too terrified to talk to anyone important about it. And I was just like, you know, if I had half of the things that are out there today, um, I would have probably like done this a little bit sooner. But, you know, same with me. You know, I had to suffer for a good 10, 12 years of my life just because I wasn't ready to do it, you know, and then. Finally, when I was ready, I like heard what I needed to hear when I needed to hear it. And like things just started to click. And, you know, I I had that, um, yeah, kind of like come to Jesus moment where I was like on my knees and just used everything I wanted to. And I was just like, dude, like, do I need to be on this earth? Like, do I need to be living right now? And then the next day, like I got my first 24 hours and I was like, you know, Um, and, and so what would you say to anyone who is, yeah, like listening right now or or creatives or business person who is struggling with, uh, addiction, who doesn't know like where, where to start or where to go? What, what would you, what advice would you have for them to help them maybe like move forward? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a tough, I mean, it's, it's simple, but it's not simple. Right. And I think the good thing these days that wasn't available back in the beginning in my day was technology, right? Cause net, because of COVID now there's all these amazing meetings all over the world. Like you yeah. can go, you can kind of anonymously go into, if you're really sketched out and you just want to, you know, go into a meeting, it's very simple. There's meetings all over the place. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, anyone can reach out to me at any time and they do any listener can, can contact me and I'll, I'll pick up the phone. I mean, the best, the I think the best way is to, you know, hook up with somebody and have coffee and talk about, talk to somebody for a while about it. But oh, yeah. uh, for me, you know, a lot, and, and also like some, some people's uh, ideas, like, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get sober. For me, AA yeah. was was my path, and mm-hmm. it works. It worked and does work for me. I think yeah. the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. I I battled it for you know a decade before I mm. got into it, and I think that even if you're not an alcoholic, it's a it's a it's a design for living for everybody, and yeah. it true it truly is a book that just it's written it's fun because it's written in the in the olden days where it's like yeah. there's a weird ways of talking like hey boy yeah she or you know and it's like yeah yeah, yeah. You can, it, it puts you in this weird times frame so it never changes so it's always which i like because they didn't update it right to like yeah, yeah. current days mm-hmm. and it's written with big let big words big letters so you can read yeah. it it's simple because a lot of alcoholics, we we also are very intelligent, have a little bit of ADD, hard to focus. Yeah. I think whoever, you know, when this was written, it was written so genius and just, mm-hmm. you know, they wrote this book so fucking smart. And I, I always think about, God, man, it's so simple, but it's just, it, right. it's just so perfect. and. I love it. I think I think my advice is tends to go towards you know let's go to let's get to a meeting. I mm. I, I, I always start off with when someone comes to me and it's like oh man. I mean let's be honest, very few people. I'll get a lot of calls and then keep what tends to happen and what happened what what I was like was I would call somebody when I was feeling like shit. And yeah. they will talk me off the ledge. They maybe I go to a meeting, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't drink for like three days, but then I start feeling better, and I'm like, oh, I'm good. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, I'm yeah. Fucking off. I'm gone again. So, yeah. so I think it's you know I always they'll say, D- I think I maybe maybe I have a problem. Maybe I'm an alcoholic, and I'll just say, well, is it fucking up your relationships? Mm-hmm. Is it messing up your work? And is it messing up your ability to enjoy the things you like to do in your life, your hobbies mm, and things. And yeah. if you can answer yes to like any of those, then maybe you need to look at it. And yeah. I think 
I love AA. I love I love everything about it. It saved my life, and okay. uh, I I that's that's my path. I have a couple friends that don't go to AA. They've been sober for decades, and mm. they they somehow do it other ways. And but I don't know that that would work for me. Yeah, because I'm fucking crazy. And if I'm yeah, sitting too. with <laughs> if I'm if I'm with this. And I don't have like a, an outlet, a solution, people to talk to, mm-hmm. like steps to go through, and like, yeah, I, I'm gonna go fucking crazy. I might as well. I, I mean, is it better to be for me to be drunk or high or just fucking crazy and an asshole, and yeah. not and well, not have the excuse of the drugs or alcohol? So, yeah, I I choose to, you know, uh, go to go to meetings and be of service also you know being of service all like like right now like we're in service right yeah. now we're having a meeting right now um okay. i pick up the phone dude i remember i don't know if you're like this but i would fucking pick up the phone before oh, yeah it's like i'm not I, but now it's like i just answer the phone you know how bad can yeah. it, it's not gonna be what's it gonna be it's not gonna be like yeah. a terrible phone call so i don't know it's it's a good life man i i, I can't yeah if I catch myself complaining, I, I probably do complain, but then I have people that put me in check. It's like, what, what the hell? I got to complain. Totally. About, I'm 54. Yeah. I'm still working a lot more than I can handle. Um, okay. I have an amazing relationship. My kids like me. My ex-wife mm. likes me. Yeah. You know, uh, I have a yeah. house. and Fuck, man. Mm. Life is really good. Talking to you. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. No, nah, I totally agree, man. Like, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. And like, I started going to AA and then I shared once in a meeting how I just wanted to stop doing drugs before going to a meeting about my alcohol. And they were like, try NA. And I was like, all right. Mm-hmm. Went to NA and I was like, Fuck, this is the fucking answer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's just it just clicked, you know, and after like reading the and that's what I also love about the literature, too, is it's like it's written in such a way to where like, you know, um, like, for instance, like the 12 by 12, we have one that it's called It Works How and Why. And it's like the 12 by 12. But oh. like I read that shit, man, and I just like tear up because I'm like, what is this? You know, like, how is this speaking so true to me and if it's speaking that true to me then it must be speaking this true to many many other people as well and like you know i i have such a um you know such a high respect for both programs because like it works you know and um yeah i mean it's just it works and it works for me and i i wouldn't be where i'm at today if it wasn't for that and so i have a i have to owe my life to narcotics anonymous for sure yeah i do i used to love going to I'd go to any meetings if I just needed to mix shit up a little bit. And like we'd have like this <laughs> yeah. clubhouse. It's like there's a there's a vibe in NA too that's really cool. I, if I if I if there's a mind. A, a is getting a little boring, I'll bump yeah. over to NA meeting and it's fun. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a little lively. Yeah, <laughs> it's lively. <laughs> Hell for, yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. So, right yeah. on, man. No. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for coming on the Last Drop Business Podcast. It's been so amazing just chopping it up with you, man. And I really hope that we get to meet in person at some point. I hope to make it down to Florida again at, you know, sometime. Uh, And yeah, man, thanks everyone for tuning in to this episode. Please share. Please give the Last Drop a rating so I can know what you think. Be sure to follow Sean on Instagram and all the other channels. He is at Murphy Photo. Uh, and also check out the last drop clothingco.com for when our next drop is coming out. Uh, got some other stuff kind of in the works and if, uh, yeah, sign up for the newsletter and you'll be the first to know. So, but thanks yeah. again, Sean, I really appreciate you, man. And um, thank yeah, thank you so much for sharing your experience, strength and hope, man. Thank you so much.